the uh, 2022 world is very different to the 2019 world. We're not going back. We are not going back to what life was. Over the last two years, we've seen the greatest transformation of mankind that we will ever see in our lifetime. And things have changed forever. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Tell you what, Code Crackers, welcome back to live shows. Yes, you've been listening to repeats. And I tell you what, there's only so many repeats you can do inside the real estate economy. So after a month of getting fat like a little sausage, I have returned And it's time to talk property, it's time to talk wealth, and today we're having the team talk. Yes, we're going to dig into some of the psychology that real estate offers, and of course, we're going to try and nudge each other forward and help each other through this idea of wealth creation, because I tell you what, sometimes a little pep talk goes a long way. So I thought today we'll start... I guess the new shows with a bit of a pep talk. It's going to be a big year. Uh, I tell you what, I've got some great shows and content lined up. I want to share as much as I can when it comes to real estate. If it's your first time tuning in, welcome aboard to the Urban Property Investor. We are a mad bunch here. We love property. We love gobnicks. Uh, we love everything about the idea of creating wealth. There's a few rules with the show. Make sure you play the show in double speed. Get your life back. If you don't know how to do that, there is a great search engine out there called Google, which can tell you anything. You do not need school anymore because Google uh, will school you. Hey, I tell you what, the last month I have enjoyed doing nothing. It's probably fair to say after the craziness of last year, lockdowns and real estate, I was a bit frazzled. I was burnt out and I needed a good refreshing break. So I apologize for playing four episodes uh, and allowing myself to... I don't know, disappear from this world, which was fantastic, by the way. I had a great uh, adventure. I've been diving with dolphins, diving with sharks. I've been to little Gopnik villages around Australia, and I have a lot to tell you. Hey, I tell you what, today's episode is also inspired off the back of the worst TV show on Netflix right now, Cobra Kai. Yes, Uh, If you can remember, if you're old enough, the Karate Kid, yes, they've uh, uh, created a rebirth of the Karate Kid sort of 35 years later and uh, a lot of my holiday, vegetating, I was watching shit TV. And uh, really, this shit TV show, Cobra Kai, is inspired today's show because there's a lot of... I guess, conversations uh, that uh, Johnny Lawrence and Daniel LaRusso and Mr. Miyagi have when it comes to, you know, getting your mind right for the karate fight. And real estate is a bit of a karate fight at times. So uh, I was thinking, how will I kick off the year? And then, you know, last night watching uh, shit TV, it really inspired me for today's show. So does that sound inspirational to you? Probably not. But I tell you what, uh, there is some uh, good, good lessons I think we can take away from uh, really the way the world has changed. And I want to share those lessons with you. And of course, um, we're going to dig into some of the mindset games that happen inside of real estate. Hey, uh, shout out to Georgie's brother-in-law. Yes, Georgie's brother-in-law. Now, I am coming out of the closet. I do Pilates. Yes. 
Uh, I identify as a woman when it comes to sport and I frequent a Pilates studio. And uh, it's been my dirty little secret for over a year and a half. About a year and a half ago, I broke my arm mountain biking and I was researching what type of sport you can do when you're injured. And I came across Pilates, which... Uh, if anyone knows the history of Pilates, um, after World War I, uh, the dude that invented Pilates was kind of bedridden uh, after, obviously, some war injuries and invented this thing called Pilates, where you could sort of sit on a reformer or a machine and do all sorts of movements. So I broke my arm a year and a half ago doing something really manly, uh, basically going headfirst into a rock off a mountain bike and uh, took up Pilates and uh, I haven't stopped. And I tell you what, it's uh, it's not a bad sport. I do other sports, of course, but my dirty little secret, my man shame has been uh, I frequent a Pilates studio. I am generally the only male species in the Pilates studios. In fact, when they have classes, they, they refer to me as a girl. Uh, Georgie, she uh, always shouting out, come on, girls, you can do it. Um, she doesn't even say, you know, come on, girls, and boy. it's uh, So I identify as a woman when it comes to sport. And why I'm telling you this story is Georgie, the other night, uh, mentioned her brother-in-law is a avid listener of the show, a fan of the show, and outed me. So, hey, if you're Georgie's brother-in-law listening, uh, thanks for listening in. In fact, over uh, the course of the last year, we've had over 100,000 downloads, which um, is great. So, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the show. Uh, I know I'm rabbiting on right now, but, uh, hey, it's... it's, uh, it's so nice that so many people care about property and enjoy really listening to me rabbit on by myself. Um, I made a conscious decision back in the beginning uh, to, to really go it alone when it came to talking real estate. And obviously, uh, so far, so good. Uh, I haven't had a guest on the show at this time, but um, that's not to say I won't start a new podcast perhaps with with some guests as well. And I'm thinking about doing a new podcast on uh, actually holding real estate, which uh, I think is one of the biggest challenges most property investors have. Hey, I tell you what, uh, the last month I have done so much travel. Uh, it is been amazing. I tell you what, if anyone's been in lockdowns, uh, they would know that you basically have to almost release yourself back into the world and you go a bit bananas. And it's no wonder Omicron is spreading like wildfire. It feels like everyone I know has COVID or has had COVID. I haven't had COVID. Have you guys had COVID? Um, I'm still COVID free, so to speak, but uh, it surprises me I am because I have been running around town like, uh, uh, you know, man possessed and seeing everything I could possibly see over the last month and enjoying myself, that is for sure. And I tell you what, uh, I don't think a day goes by without um, a casual contact beep coming to my phone, uh, just going to the local shops. It seems uh, everyone's uh, got a bit of the old COVID. So uh, we'll see how that pans out. But I tell you what, uh, I have traveled <clears throat> to just about every lifestyle village there is in New South Wales and a fair few Bogan villages as well. And I tell you what, those little Gopnik villages have become expensive, haven't they? And, you know, I think uh, there is some good insights into the demographics as to what is unfolding in real estate when it comes to leading lifestylers, choosing where they want to own real estate, what they'll pay for real estate, that aspirational end of the market, looking for the right properties. And of course, 
Uh, other people following both the leading lifestylers and the aspirationals into the market. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But today on the show, we're going to have the team talk. Uh, we're going to leave the Bogan Gopnik villages behind. Uh, and there are so many Bogan Gopnik villages in Australia. It's unbelievable just how many shit places there are. Uh, when McDonald's is the best thing you've got in your village, uh, you have to question yourself as to if you are living in the right place. There is so much out there, folks. Uh, so m- this show is dedicated to those that live in Gopnik villages that only have McDonald's to serve uh, the community. If you live in a Gopnik village where McDonald's is the first thing open in the morning, this show is for you because I want you to explore the world. Now, i tell you what, if uh, I have one criticism when it comes to uh, the holiday period, it's got to be gangers. Yes, gangers are those people that work late at night fixing our roads, our world-class road system. Now, for whatever reason, uh, I don't know if you guys experience this, but you know, typically on a freeway or a highway, you you know, you're traveling at 80, 90, 110 kilometers per hour. For whatever reason, the gangers go home and leave uh, their sign up, construction work ahead, go 40, and they're not working. They're not even there. And the whole uh, basically road system comes to a crawl in the middle of the peak holiday period to go 40 when there's no construction workers on the road system. So uh, if you're a, I don't know, the powers that be, please consider talking to the gangers and making sure they take their uh, signs home at night because us mere society, uh, we just want to zoom around and have a holiday, right? We've been locked up that long. But it is interesting, uh, I think, what I have noticed when it comes to the price guides and the people flowing into the different marketplaces around Australia. It is it is really, really interesting. I was actually blown away with some of the prices I saw um, inside of coastal New South Wales. Certainly what that has really reinforced to me is there is such good value when it comes to buying today in some of our larger urban land masses, places like Perth and Brisbane and, and of course, Melbourne um, and many other places where there's really good uh, jobs on offer and obviously many tenants to choose from. What I, what I have noticed is uh, just some of the prices which – Today, people have paid for sleepy little villages, which seem really great during a holiday period, but would be rather isolated uh, non-holiday time is, is incredible. And I think it's fair to say we need to understand that demographically speaking, inside the real estate economy, there is... Um, different groups which have different lifestyle habits which dominate the real estate marketplace. And I've talked about this before. Uh, You may remember me talking about Hearth and Homers, which is a typical real estate shopper. And the Hearth and Homer, of course, buys a home in Ness and, and obviously spends all of their time, all of their money, Um, making sure their home is absolutely great. And, you know, a lot of people today have become hearth and homers um, because of the cost of real estate, because really uh, the idea of a cheap hotspot being about is is actually uh, over in Australian real estate. So, in other words, um, people can't necessarily trade in their property and just go and find a better property, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's harder than ever before. And of course, those hearth and homers um, are basically renovating their houses. They're spending 
extra money, extra equity, um, topping up their equity, and you're seeing so much renovation around Australia. I was blown away with just how many properties are under renovation in Australia. What this tells me <clears throat> is a lot of Australians are going to hold real estate a lot longer than typical. Now, typically, you know, the average property in Australia gets held for around sort of 10 years. Um, and then someone changes their lifestyle position or their family position and they, they trade in and out. Um, of course, I think to become wealthy out of real estate, the golden rule is to buy well and really never sell. Um, and one of the big things that a lot of Australians do is for the first 10 years, they never actually pay down their mortgage. They only rely on growth and of course, start a new mortgage. And of course, uh, the idea of amortization means that it's very hard for debt to be reduced in the first 10 years of any mortgage. So the fact that a lot of Australians are holding on to real estate and rather than flipping it, renovating it and becoming a hearth and homer, becoming a Bunnings guy is probably a good sign for the stability of real estate. Probably the second group I noticed which is out and about buying real estate. And we know the real estate market has been very much driven by owner-occupiers, but who are these owner-occupiers driving the real estate marketplace? Well, the second group, uh, after those damn hearth and homers, which I always have battles with, is the aspirationals. Really, the aspirational, if you like, is driven by a idea of dreaming of a big future. Uh, they are almost audacious and ambitious when it comes to what they want in life. And they will work hard uh, today to create a successful tomorrow. And if you were to dig into their persona, they are savvy shoppers. They are all about a prosperous future. They are trend hunters. And because they're trend hunters, they are following a lot of the major trends in the real estate marketplace today. Those trends include the idea of uh, finding a lifestyle suburb to live in or a lifestyle village. Um, they are experience seekers. So they don't want to live a life, uh, I guess, like their parents in a way. Um, they want to experience life. So what that means is waking up and jumping in the water and having a snorkel, snorkel going fishing at night, uh, going bushwalking during the day, going to Pilates. They could be Pilates people, experience seekers. And really their world is about getting ahead, but also uh, making sure they are really connected to this thing called lifestyle seeking. And uh, if anything, they are the ones that uh, – really uh, create a fad and uh, follow the fad. Either they're creators of the fad or they follow the fad. Now, as, as it, it has been well documented, a lot of Australians have gone to coastal communities to buy the real estate that was affordable in those coastal communities. But today, it is rather expensive. Uh you know, by way of example, um, you know, a uh, a home down on the south coast of New South Wales, three hours from Sydney, um, you know, close to the water, you know, you're probably, prob probably dropping, you know, 1.8 to $2.5 million, okay? So what that shows us is there is... Uh, a need for people to find these lifestyle suburbs. Our job as a property investor into 2022 is to continue this concept. Where can we find the lifestyle? Because the lifestyle will bring the aspirational. Trend hunters, experience seekers, lifestyle seekers, uh, all about a prosperous future. And of course, they bring with it that gentrification, which quite often makes real estate great. You know, they'll bring with them um, some of the coffee culture, the microbrewery culture. Uh, they'll bring the fads. And the fads, of course, make 
real estate suburb sticky, where the stickier the suburb, um, really the less real estate traded and the more expensive real estate ends up becoming. So Hearth and Homers are renovating. These aspirationals are, my God, they're, uh, they're everywhere and they're becoming even more aspirational. And I've always said that our job as a property investor, particularly if we're buying sort of $500,000, $600,000, $800,000 real estate is to work out where these aspirationals are going and, and follow them because they are a massive trend center when it comes to capital growth in real estate. And of course, uh, the final group, which is obvious, that is a persona that is making real estate even more expensive than you can possibly imagine around Australia is, of course, the leading lifestylers. Now, to categorize a leading lifestyler as a persona, they are smart about money. They're really, if they were a stock, they would be blue chip. They would be, you know, the BHP or the NAB stock, if you like. Um, they are really visibly successful. Um, they are achievers. They've achieved success through their careers or are achieving success through their careers. They are humanitarian. They're already leapfrogged just thinking about themselves and now they're into philanthropy. Um, they're self-starters. They, they really um, can you know, dictate what they want, where they want. And if anything, they really are worldly and rather wise. And this group or this category of human being is very much paying uh, into the multi-millions for real estate at the moment. And of course, this is dragging up um, and making it virtually uh, impossible to find affordable real estate in some very good blue chip lifestyle suburbs. And of course, the eradication of uh, lifestyle suburbs because of the leading lifestyles is something that is unfolding. And of course, I've been open about this last year. You may have heard me talk about the idea of extremistan, the idea that uh, extreme real estate is unfolding, extreme prices are unfolding. And of course, what this does to a property investor is makes it more difficult to find the more blue chip type of real estate suburbs to hold real estate in. Not impossible. And my job is to make the problem go away or it to, to certainly solve the problem as best as I can for people inside the real estate marketplace. But it's fair to say these leading lifestylers are paying big dollars. Now, there's a town... Uh, on the Shoalhaven on the south coast of New South Wales, probably about two hours from Sydney. It's called Berry. Uh, it's a very, very quaint little village. You could drive through it in about one minute. There's really not a hell of a lot to do in Berry other than uh, have a nice little cup of tea, uh, a scone. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, um, I don't know, go to the pub and have a pint. What else can you do in Berry? Uh, you can buy haberdashery, some lovely haberdashery in Berry, and uh, really, you know, Berry is that stop when you need to stretch your legs from driving down to the south coast. You need a little stop. Um, really, uh, because of COVID, I think there's two restaurants left in Berry, but the prices of Berry, which is a very historic town. Uh, you know, which date back to the sort of the turn of the last century are rather expensive. You uh, can buy a, uh, you know, tin and timber, uh, basically uh, freestanding home on about a 600 square meter block, which is heritage listed uh, because, uh, you know, obviously the, the, you know, it's over a hundred years old pre-war Um you know, uh, two million, two million, uh, two million dollars to live in an itchy pre-war home, which is not modern. Uh, but I tell you what, the smart money has already bought up that town. Now, 
Obviously, on Instagram, it looks great. There's a there's a donut vendor there. You know, he sells deep fried donuts. Like that's an amazing thing. Everyone stops in Berry to get the deep fried donut. Um, but I tell you what, what it what it does show is that if we can find where this blue chip money goes or this aspirational money goes or where these hearthanomas are going to renovate and hold, we're going to find some pretty decent suburbs to own real estate in because those areas, real estate moves at a big, big, big rate. In fact, um, prices can jump exponentially. So uh, it is fair to say that some of these coastal towns have just done really, really well, which are just so drivable to um, a major urban landmass. So where I see the market in 2022 is certainly urban buying. Some of these uh, para-urban areas, which are you know fundamentally connected to major, major uh, urban areas are very good as well. Uh, I think some of the places where you have to get on a plane to connect um, may struggle. But from a regional point of view, certainly the south coast of of New South Wales is is booming. Uh, it's two, three hours from Sydney and it, and it makes sense, right? Uh, Sydney is an expensive place. The horse bolted uh, fairly well for you know, uh, blue chip Sydney long ago. So it makes a lot of sense to me. And there's a lot of lessons in New South Wales. If you ever want to understand what will happen in Victoria or South Australia, Western Australia, or um, of course, Queensland, New South Wales is the best marketplace to understand. It's kind of 10 years ahead of every other marketplace. So You've got uh, places like Byron Bay where you, you're seeing this kind of uh, aspirational marketplace just in, uh, evolve into just an incredible place. You've got Sydney, which is now Extremistan. You've got the south coast of uh, New South Wales, two, three hours from Sydney, which is again becoming um, unaffordable, right? And so... Uh, it is a really, really, really good case study of what uh, eventually will unfold in other marketplaces. And of course, very much people uh, who do have money in both Melbourne and also Sydney that are looking for that lifestyle, looking for that aspiration, quite often uh, are willing to move to uh, find it. And of course, we're seeing huge amounts of movement into Southeast Queensland, particularly from the aspirational and leading lifestyle category, which uh, is a good category, right? It's a great category. That's not to say that homes in Sydney and Melbourne get abandoned in that category. It's almost like um, there is uh, someone who's willing to even pay more to push those people away. Um, and get hold of that blue chip asset. All right. Well, I tell you what, we haven't even started the team talk. Uh, that was my summary of my holiday. And we are 27 minutes into the show. So we need to get our wriggle on. Now, I tell you what, I wanted to have the team talk today because uh, let's face it, I think uh, to kick off a year, we need to sometimes give ourselves a bit of a dead leg. Yes, we've got to wake up to what is going on. And we live in a capitalist society. And I tell you what, if anything, we live in a fictitious capitalist society. Yes, money is fake. And there is bucket loads of fake money out there. And I think quite often what I see inside of society is a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, really the idea of becoming wealthy out of real estate is is almost following the fake money. Um, the reality is around the world, there's something like $10 trillion of real currency, but because of the fiat system of money, banks can basically duplicate money and create loans. And of course, the more loans you've got, uh, the more you're playing the capitalist system. And I'm, I've said this a lot a lot of Australians are just undercapitalized. They are living in a capitalist country as undercapitalized people. Now, 
there's some good things about capitalism. There's some bad things about capitalism. Uh, I'm not here to talk about capitalism, but let's face it, the wealth effect came along and anyone with capital has done fairly well. Anyone without capital is feeling very vulnerable at the moment. And I guess to understand that, nobody goes around the Monopoly board three times and survives without buying real estate right? And think about that. You know, the monopoly board in real estate is about a 15 year journey, right? It's a cycle and it takes about 15 years to do. It can be faster, it can be slower, um, but it's typically around 15 years. And you've got to comprehend how many cycles are you going to live for? Now, you might be starting out listening to this going, well, freaking hell, I've missed five cycles already. What's going to happen next? And something will happen next. This is the the big conversation. And, and certainly from a demographics point of view, I can see that the baby boomers are going to drop dead uh, down the track, probably into the 2030s. That's going to create a definite structural movement in real estate. So there are cycles ahead. Uh, of course, you know, there are some I guess, market movers, which will push cycles along things like the Brisbane Olympics, uh, things like massive infrastructure expenditure inside of, for example, the city of Melbourne. So there are movers that will move the monopoly board. And I think a lot of uh, Australians are just undercapitalized. They are traveling around their own monopoly board and not buying anything. They're not doing anything. Uh, 10 years goes by pretty quickly in real estate terms. Um, And of course, if you're not playing the game, you've got to question yourself, well, why not? What is holding you back? And, you know, the reality is uh, if you want to be wealthier, you need to play. You need to use energy. And energy is, I guess, one of the big conversations when it comes to wealth. I certainly... Uh, have been guilty in the past of running out of energy to do something inside of economics. Burnt out, can't be bothered, uh, just lazy, and it's cost me money. You know, um, I've been put in situations where, you know, I've been advised to get on with it, buy some shares, buy some certain stocks buy some certain coins and procrastinate and the very next day, boom, you know, prices more than what it was yesterday. And real estate is really no no different. And unless you devote some energy to wealth, uh, you're going to, to miss the boat. And really, when you think about wealth, what is it? It actually is energy. The more you put into creating wealth, the more energy you're devoting to that system. And, you know, a big, big portion of my energy goes to wealth creation. I wish sometimes I had more energy to create even more wealth, but so far, so good. And, you know, if you're not devoting some time per day, per week to this thing called wealth, if you're not devoting energy to it, you're going to get the result of that. You're going to face that direction. You, we all face the direction we create. And for most uh, people, they're just not putting enough energy into this idea of real estate. And, you know, sometimes energy is about borrowing other people's energy. You can use my energy. You know, I say this all the time, you know, uh, just think of me as someone briefing you on what is occurring out there and use some of my energy, not all of it, um, you know, get some other points of view, get out there and and uh, get involved. But I think it's fair to say that uh, we now live in a period of time where we need to expect the unexpected, right? Like things are changing every single day. And the reality is when you put your energy into something and it changes, it can quite often create a procrastination effect because when people procrastinate, the simple truth of that is they usually are uneducated as to 
what is going on. And I think the best thing you can do when it comes to any wealth system is get educated because education is not necessarily about, you know, getting, you know, your mind controlled or something like that. It is very much just about being in the know, right? And I, you know, I run an education business and quite often people, you know, have some fear around education. They're like, oh, what are, what are you going to do to me? What are you going to, uh, what are you going to, tr- how are you going to transform my life? Um, and, you know, don't let that hold you back because education is just about being informed, right? And, you know, though I do this podcast, there are literally daily things I do for my clientele that educates them, that puts them in a position where they're going to win. You know, luck is this idea that, uh, you know, the more you put yourself in a position to win, you're going to be luckier. And uh, luck just doesn't come along um, you know, it's it's one in a hundred million that something's going to strike you lucky. The reality is you've got to put yourself in the right position to find luck. And, you know, let's face it, we're in a new world, right? The, the uh, 2022 world is very different to the 2019 world. We're not going back. We are not going back to what life was. Over the last two years, we've seen the greatest transformation of mankind that we will ever see in our lifetime. And things have changed forever. So, you know, we've got to adapt, pivot and play. And, you know, we now live in a, a, a situation where politicians are in charge of our world. And... Political systems don't necessarily go back once they reach a new place. And what that fundamentally means is now nothing makes sense. Uh, Nothing at all makes sense. You know, the reality is prior to coronavirus, we wouldn't spend $60 billion as a country to build a fast rail system from Melbourne to Cairns. We wouldn't spend it. Now we've spent a trillion dollars on really... What? I don't even know. Uh, Stimulus to keep the economy going. And, you know, it's fair to say the stimulus boom, which has created, um, you know, the wealth effect, if you like, it's it's fictitious. Uh, If the economy was great, do you think you would need to spend a trillion dollars to make it tick? Uh, no is the is the answer, right? The, if the economy was good, you would not be spending a cent. So what that ultimately tells us is capitalism is fictitious. The more problems there are, the more the politicians try and solve it, the more money they throw at it, the more money thrown into the economy, the more money that it creates. In fact, downturns create wealth. That's what we've seen. We saw it after the GFC and we certainly saw it after coronavirus. Structural wealth gets created. So am I looking forward to downturns? Yes, I am. Because more happens in a downturn than really does when things are good. When things are flowing along nicely, um, you know, uh, the politicians can't meddle with the system. And and really, it's fair to say the Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, which used to be in control of the economy, is now uh, less so in charge because it just takes one uh, little whinge here or there. And guess what? We're spending more money as a country on something. And uh, again, it's money we do not have. So uh, politicians are fundamentally running the show. And again, I think uh, there's some good bits to that. There's some tough bits to that. They've helped a lot of people get through some tough times. That's great. Um, but at some point, we need to get back to work. And of course, what is fair is not fair. So a lot of people were playing the fair game prior to coronavirus coming along. They were 
uh, you know, uh, wanting fiscal security from their country. They thought that was fair. Along comes a trillion dollar stimulus package. Uh, that's not fair. That's not fair. Someone's got to pay the bill for that. The check in the the check for that's in the mail. Someone's going to pay. Uh, but what it has done is created so much wealth for so many people, and so many people missed out, and that's not fair. But if unless you put yourself in a position for opportunity, you're never going to feel that anything is fair. It's now part of the game, right? You live in a capitalist country. It's fictitious capitalism. Money can be printed tomorrow morning and pushed into the economy and that will inflate assets. And again, you need to think that you are now part of this fictitious system and unless you're going to play, you're going to miss out. Now, a lot of people may hear that and go, well, that just sounds like horrible to me. Uh, that sounds like something that is a bubble that is going to burst. Well, the real estate economy is such a big rock that it's fair to say the whole of the Australian economy is now geared around real estate. So uh, will it have a downturn? No doubt. Will it uh, continue to do something into the future? Yes, it will, because a lot of our economics is around services and so many services are connected to the real estate economy. And, uh, you know, I quite often have this conversation with people like, uh, and and going to some of these Gopnik villages uh, on the south coast of New South Wales, I, I like, what do people do here? What, what are these towns based on? And really, they're not based on anything. You build houses, houses create... Uh, a need for services, services create jobs, jobs uh, fundamentally create this idea of almost like a, a game of town planning, you know, so you build a house, all of a sudden someone needs a Bunnings, all of a sudden people need food, so they need the Gopnik McDonald's uh, and uh, the Gopnik McDonald's has a plumbing problem, so they need a plumber and so you have this kind of fictitious economic system, which basically is services jobs that serve really no purpose other than people live in these places. And again, uh, this idea of economics is that we need to play the system which has been created. And really the best way to beat the system is to out-inflate the inflation rate and the best way to do that in Australia is real estate and will uh, you know a one million dollar property become a two million dollar property rates are going to be low for a very long time the, the only way to make things change is to inflate wages and that will be the only thing that pushes up um, you know pushes up interest rates um, and you know, if we can get migrants back into the country, which are desperately needed, if you go around to any restaurant in anywhere, I would imagine, uh, they are understaffed. A lot of people are understaffed. If we do get 200,000 new migrants into the country very, very soon, um, that will have a cooling effect on wage growth. And of course, that will have a cooling effect on interest rate rises. So it's an interesting place. This is, uh, it's, a, it's, you know, it's an interesting dynamic. I'm going to come back and talk to you about migration and migration economics. I wrote about migration economics years ago in one of my books and really is the great uh, fictitious Ponzi scheme of of Australia. And uh, I want to talk to you about that. I want to give you a lot of insights into how it works and why we need to play this game in this fictitious landscape. And the reason I, I use the word fictitious and the idea that what is fair is not fair is I want you to understand a lot of people analyze this stuff and over dramatize what is going on. The reality is the 
government is in charge of the of the economy. They are pushing money into the economy. The economy is responding off the back of a stimulus boom. And unless you have assets that uh, connect to that stimulus boom, you're not booming. And the reality is for most people, even though real estate assets have gone up, uh, even if they were to adjust, they would still actually make more uh, despite fluctuations over the long term. And into the future, will there be more structural shifts? Absolutely, there will be. So what are you waiting for? Like you're going around the Monopoly board. uh, What are you actually waiting for? Uh, Are you waiting for a crash? Because the command economy has shown us that the government will not let the real estate market crash. We learned that during coronavirus. We learned that the Australian government is willing to prop up the real estate marketplace. Uh, The banks are willing to prop up the Australian marketplace. Everyone has a vested interest in seeing this thing work. And that in itself is probably the greatest lesson we can walk away from Uh, really the last two years worth of real estate is not so much the success of real estate, but the fact that no one wants to receive real estate fail. Uh, And I don't think you will see, certainly in the next 20 years, a a 50% bloodbath drop in values in real estate will not happen. If anything, we're just going back to a more normal state where we are not being overstimulated, where Uh, you know, the government is creating basically a boom. Now, if you miss the boom, the reality is problems are just a sign of life. Like we've all got problems. I've got problems. I've just been outed as a Pilates man, identifying as a woman in a Pilates studio. Do you think that's a problem? It's a big problem. I didn't want anyone to know about that. Uh, I didn't want my friends to know about that that I uh, frequent a Pilates studio, it's a sign of life. Problems are a sign of life. And uh, what I can tell you about problems is it's just not having the experience uh, to solve the problem. A problem to you is not a problem to me, right? And it's just basically the conversation is anyone who feels like they have a problem, it's usually they've just never experienced the situation they're in. But to other people, Uh, who have experienced that situation, the conversation is not a problem. And this is why ultimately I think we need to continue the conversation around this pep talk about basically making sure you are surrounding yourself with good education. Um, You know, the reality is problems uh, are generally driven through procrastination some sort of righteousness and some sort of perfection uh, and usually driven around money beliefs. And, uh, you know, what I have enjoyed a lot is going back to some of the people who play or hate me on, uh, on sort of Facebook, you know, back in 2020, um, sending me text, the real estate market's going to crash, um, you know, Uh, anyone who's a property investor is a scoundrel, Um, you know, all of this kind of dialogue that you get. And I go back to those texts and I text people, hey, mate, how did did your prediction go? Because a lot of people who are righteous around things um, that have money beliefs around really the uh, uh, non-capitalist economy have not understood that capitalism is is really this idea of you've just got to constantly feed the machine and uh, you know eventually we'll probably see something break but uh, it certainly won't break to the point where um, you know most Australians are going to be um, living on the street and uh, typically what we see here in Australia is a twenty percent growth rate rise uh, with about a 5 to 10% decline. So you get this push me, pull me effect. And if you invest over the long term, none of this absolutely matters. That's the biggest takeaway I really want from this pep talk is none of this matters 
if you have a 15 or 20 or 25 year horizon, because you will get growth, you will get a market mover pushing you, your properties forward, uh, and you know, you'll probably get some sort of structural shift happen into the future. What that looks like, I don't know. Um, but let's face it, if you are not where you want to be financially, you need to recognize that. Uh, you need to take responsibility for that. You can't blame someone for that responsibility. You can't outsource that. Uh, property is not this super, you know, super human uh, dynamic. It's not something which, you know, uh, can ultimately solve all your problems. If anything, property brings more problems because of the bills and the rents and the, you know, the the ongoing uh, care it needs. So those more problems bring more energy that you have to put into it, more psychology that you have to devote to the system. But don't be unrealistic, right, uh, about your expectations. You know, the reality is the wealth effect has unfolded. Let's move on. Let's move to the next stage of this thing because if you're going to sit there going, well, I missed the boat or am I paying a little bit too much for real estate today or, um, you know, should I sit out of the real estate market for the next seven years or 10 years? Uh, you are not playing the economy of what it is. You are not playing what uh, is in front of you and you are going around the monopoly board not buying real estate. And again, even if things go a little bit sour, which I hope they do, you're no doubt going to get um, a better deal buying uh, in a sour market than you are in a hot market. But no matter what the market is, the point is you've got to take action. And when you take action, you get results. Uh, When you sit on the sideline, you don't. And that is so true of really the last two years of real estate. And without question, moving into the next few years of real estate, we are going to see low rates. We're going to see a lot of activity. We're going to see continued movement from aspirationals and hearth and homers. And of course, those uh, leading lifestylers looking to buy real estate with cash And of course, interest rates don't mean a damn thing to those people. So again, sometimes I think we sit at the bottom of the food chain wondering what is going on whilst uh, rich people just get richer. And rich people are not worried about the fictitious economy, which is capitalism. They are not worried about uh, really the overstimulation of real estate. They are not worried about 20% capital growth rates. They're not worried about any of that. And again, it's just because they've had more experience. They've been around the monopoly board more often. They've seen things come into the real estate market that novice real estate people have never seen. Uh, They've seen structural change in the real estate market. Now, I've done five booms, five. I've done five of these things, just like you witnessed over the last two years. Uh, in my career of buying real estate, I've done about five of these these booms. I've done five. Um, and each time they come, you know, you kind of feel like, well, that's got to be it. But guess what? It's not the end. And again, um, between booms, sometimes there is a trough, a period of, of stagnation, but It also creates opportunity for just more a normalized marketplace whilst you position yourself for the next boom. And of course, a lot of the buying that is unfolding um, will still mirror what uh, certainly a lot of society wants. Lifestyle, real estate, good suburbs, close to schools, good, um, good places which are going to perform consistently despite whatever happens inside of economics. You know, don't be, uh, don't be afraid um, to, to get involved in the real estate marketplace. It's going to continue to be something of interest. There's no stock in the marketplace. It's very undersupplied. 
So uh, I think certain markets will absolutely do some good levels of growth. And uh, I think I mentioned this on my New Year's Eve podcast. We are actually seeing uh, marketplaces um, suggested to grow anywhere from 6 to 10%, which is massive, right? So uh, jump in if you can. Hey, thank you for tuning in to me returning uh, to talk to you about real estate. I will catch you on a new episode uh, next week. So uh, bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.